This morning I want to talk about <clears throat> the other side of the storm. The other side of the storm. The book of Jonah, 1 Kings 19, Mark chapter 4. The other side of the storm. You may be seated. Thank you, Al. David Levinson has been on the New York bestseller list for the last several weeks for his new novel entitled, Tell Me How This Now Ends. It is the story of the painful dynamics of a Jewish family? That's the question, or it could be, the question on the lips of so many people here or listening. How does this all end? Hurricanes have wrecked houses and communities. A couple of weeks ago in Houston, now Florida, yesterday the Caribbeans, later today and tomorrow the eastern coast. How does it end? Financial uncertainty, job insecurity, health problems, tuition bills, you can add your category in the list. How does it end? And when it ends, does it end well? And yet you and I are Christian and we hold to the belief that the God of the water is the God of care and concern and the God who will not leave us or forsake us. But don't misunderstand me. I'm not proclaiming some Pollyanna faith. I'm a Christian primarily because my faith looks at the existential realities of life square in the face and call it what it is. There's an entire book in the Bible dedicated to human suffering and existential problems named Job that focuses on the dynamics of birth and death, good and evil, God and Satan. So this is not some preacher pumping smoke in a dark situation. No Pollyanna gospel. No feel good. It is to look at life squarely in the face and interpret it from the perspective of the God who has called us to love him through the person Jesus Christ. In fact, situations like this are good ways to test your faith, to ask yourself, run it across the grid, why am I a Christian? It is because the faith that I embrace is not a religion of escapism. There have been and there are some that are facing atrocity by drinking up, smoking up, snorting up to avoid the catastrophes and the realities of life. There are even some that had hurricane parties to, pre to pretend that the hurricane and its winds are not as devastating as proposed. 
You can party all you want, it won't stop the storm from coming. Storms come, storms go. But I know who I'm preaching to and I know the congregation of people around the globe that listen to me that will say to me, speak for yourself, I'm good and my life was avoided from hurricane. Those that were touched were touched because they're evil, they have not done something right. That has been the silly, sophomoric, and sinful thinking of people from the beginning of time to believe that avoidance of a problem is because you're better. It could be God knows you couldn't handle a real catastrophe, so he would never allow one to come your way. So we have the word of God before us. And what does it say to us in the face of life difficulties and how can we handle the storms when they come? And they will come. And when they go, they will come back again. Storms keep coming. They're indiscriminate. They are not very interested where you live, uh, what title before or after your name, uh, what accumulated resources you have. Storms come to test the very vitality of our life. So what can we learn from Jonah and Elijah and Jesus, only three of others, who had storm problems. But one thing that we can learn about storms is storms are real. And they come and they will not overpower the purposes of God. You should remember that thematically. Storms are real and storms come, but not even storms can prevent the purposes of God. Jonah had been given one primary project to preach the gospel of repentance to Nineveh, to take a journey to the big city, stand up, and tell the city to turn around, change their mind about God, and follow after him. One morning, Jonah got up to take passage. He booked his ticket. He got on board a cargo ship, and the ticket was stamped Tarshish when he was supposed to have been going to Nineveh. And so he recalibrated the direction that he wanted to go to and he took off in the wrong direction with the purpose of God on board with him. And before he could get to where he wanted to go, a violent wind and waves thrust against the ship to almost tear it apart and everybody who never prayed started praying because they thought that they were going to their watery graves. Everybody prayed but one person, a passenger with Tasha stamped on his ticket was awakened and asked why had he not prayed and it's simply this, if it's a storm, I'm the reason because I'm going in the wrong direction. And God will send storms to reclaim your attention and no storm can stop the purposes of God. Elijah should have been celebrating the victory of Mount Carmel. He had declared that he was one of the only prophets to remain faithful to God. And now after defeat, after a glorious victory at the epitome of Carmel, he makes his run 
Not in victory laps, but in fear, frightened for his life, he finds a cave. And in that very cave, he tries to avoid the purposes of God. Jonah needed to get to Nineveh. Elijah needed to get to the kings to coronate them and to anoint his successor. But he got hung up in a cave but the purposes of God will not be overpowered. Jesus got on a boat, invited his disciples to go across the Sea of Galilee with him. And as he journeyed, a storm broke out and tested the faith of his disciples. And these disciples who had seen him dispel demons out of human beings. Give new legs to people that didn't have any. Give sight to people that have been born blind. Began to question his ability. The purpose of the boat ride was not just to get from one side to the other. The purpose of the boat ride was so that the disciples would know actually who Jesus is. And sometimes storms can blind you to that reality. But regardless of what storm has come in your life, whether it be physical or financial or emotional or psychological, whatever level of storm it is, when God has a purpose for your life, he will get you to that purpose whether you want to get there or not. I could preach right there for a minute. But there are some of you, you remember when God told you to go to Nineveh, and you decided to go to Tarshish. Some of you, like Elijah, you remember when you should have been taking a victory lap, but you parked in your own private cave to say, I quit. I won't preach no more. I won't sing no more. I won't usher no more. I won't serve no more. I won't greet anymore. But God knows where you are, even if you're in a cave, because he's the maker of the cave. Or you may be on a passage crossing from one side to the other and storms come out. God will reveal who he is and his purposes shall never, ever be overpowered. Storms are real. But storms teach us something else when you look at all of them in these Bible st uh, storms. And that is, is that storms come so that you can get to the people that's on the other side of the storm. Storms come because there are other people that's camped out on the other side of the storm waiting for you. Yes, I'm pointing at you. Not the person next to you, but you. That God has a purpose with another person after the storm just for you. Nobody likes storms. I mean, if you're a sailor, the fierce winds can be exciting in a sail as long as the storm don't come. You don't mind the winds. And so there are other people, Jonah, on the other side. And so Jonah booked passage to go to Tarshish. He's thrown overboard now and the storm immediately desists. And God had already programmed the GPS of a big fish to pick him up, to take him where he was supposed to go. Because there are some people waiting on Jonah on the other side of the storm. On the other side of the storm, the Ninevites, pure pagans, Gentiles, people who have no book like this in their hand are waiting for him to get to the other side. Like you, storms may have come that while you were taking water and bread and biscuit to help your neighbor, it may have been that wonderful opportunity to say, I want to give you bread, but I got some other bread. Here's some water, but I got some other water. Living water, living bread. 
other people on the other side. Elijah is in a cave avoiding his responsibility and he sees the lightning, hears the thunder, feels the wind, and then he sees a cloud about the size of a man's hand. He's made every excuse for being in that cave. But there are some other people on the other side of the storm after the wind broke the rocks and after the earthquake and after the wind and after the fire, there are some people down the road, two kings to be coronated, his successor to be ordained. And the kings cannot be crowned and his successor cannot be elevated to the place of his position unless Elijah get out the cave. You don't know who God has waiting for you on the other side of the storm. Some of us have been cynical and sour about life, but it's a strange thing about catastrophes in the need, in the real need. Now I know that you got some arrogant people we had some come on our own campus. They were mad that we didn't have Ozark because we had something else. If you thirsty, you just need some water. Some people were mad because we didn't have Gucci and Louis Vuitton. I told them, said, you know, when you're naked, you just need some clothes. When you are hungry, you just need some food. And I can tell by your reaction that you're on the side of those that are ungrateful, but I can only speak for myself. I know what it means to have, and I know what it means not to have. And people don't have to be nice. I don't care how much Jesus they got. Anybody that's nice to me, I got to thank you, Jesus, attached to it because everybody got enough personal problem that they could just be self-indulged by themselves. Preach, Pastor West. There are people on the other side. God had waiting for you. Now, that doesn't mean that they're going to be nice when you get there. You can go help people and they not be nice. I didn't mean to go this far, but I feel like it's some preaching right there. You, you need to know that. That's why I said the Christian faith is not a Pollyanna religion. It don't always come out quite the way you want it to. It's always dark clouds among the silver lining. But don't you worry about their disposition, their bad attitude. There's another that's celebrating the goodness that you extend to somebody else. If I can help somebody as I pass along, if I can cheer somebody with a word or song, if I can show somebody that they're traveling wrong, then my living shall not be in vain. Let me give you one more now. Jesus got on that boat because there was somebody on the other side waiting for him. You know, the book of Mark, for those of you that just want a good gospel to read, read Mark. You can read it in about three hours, just straight through, three and a half hours, just straight through. And you pick up one great theme, and that is the disciples don't never get it. Uh, for 16 chapters, Jesus is trying to reveal to them who he is. And Jesus invites his disciples on a boat ride on the Sea of Galilee. In the middle of the ride, a storm breaks out. And in the middle of the storm, the disciples panic. They are fearful. They began to breathe out their fears and they say Jesus is asleep. Doesn't he care? And if they would have left, left Jesus asleep, if they just wouldn't have bothered him, they would have been in. They would have been in for the ride of their life. If they just would have let him sleep, they were not going to go under because Jesus had already invited them to go over. And they would have been up and down and over and to the side. And when they got to where they were going, they could have said that was the best ride of our lives. Looked like we was going to die. Looked like we was going to go under. But we could not because our security was on the boat. That's what Jesus is saying to you right now.
Now, I know it looks bad, looks dark, it is bad, but you're not going under because I promised you I'll take you over. Daddy on the boat ride, going across the sea to the other side because there's somebody waiting on them. There's a man on the other side of the sea a Gadarian demoniac, a man who is a human haunted house, a gentleman who is a walking holiday inn with 6,000 evil tenants living in his body. And Jesus is going there for one reason, not for just an ocean excursion, not for them to have just a break and resort, but I got a man over there that I need to tell about who I am so that when he finds out who I am. He can go to the 10 cities after that city and tell them who I am. The man would say, I want to go with you. Jesus would say, you can't. I need you to stay over here and tell somebody the good things that the Lord have done for you. That's why storms come our way. Some of you are in Jesus right now because somebody through a storm told you about how good God is. Some of you were in a storm and you didn't think the sun was going to ever shine again. And God got you in a position to say, I can't tell you that the storm is not going to rock your life. I can't tell you that the power is not going to be in sometime. But what I will tell you, I'll be your life preserver. I I'll be the one that sustained you. I'll be the one that keeps you. I'm the one that will keep and sustain you. Now I'm done. I got one last thing. God reminds us storms are real, but they will not overpower the purposes of God. And on the other side of the storm, God has somebody waiting on you. And then, and I'll sit down with this one. In every storm, after the storm, God is always speaking. Jonah is overboard. Big fish has taken him now where he's supposed to have been going in the first place. And in the third chapter, it says, and the word of God came to Jonah again. Get up and go to Nineveh. Again. And it happened after the storm. I didn't have this in my manuscript when I wrote it, but I just had, and I don't get many of them, just a flash of inspiration. Lord, thank you that the disobedience in my life that have called my storm doesn't prevent you from talking to me for a second time. Lord, thank you for that. Thank you for that. I really mean that. It was disobedience that caused the storm. And yet God's purpose will not be prevented and he sends word a second time. Go preach to my people. And God spoke to Jonah a second time to go down there now and rescue through the pre preaching of the gospel of repentance the people that would come to him. And you know, Jonah didn't like that too much. Uh, he really didn't. He felt like that God shouldn't speak to these pagans. But you and I, as God told Jonah, who are you? to tell me who I can be gracious to. I'm almost about ready to run around this building. Who are you to tell me who I can show who I love? They have my purpose attached to them. Elijah now, notice where God speaks after the storm. He's in the cave. He sees the lightning, hears the thunder, feels the wind, sees that little, little cloud coming up. And then he hears God speak after the storm in a still, small voice. 
the most poetic expression of God's speech in all of the Old and New Testament, the still small God voice, God speaks. God speaks. God speaks. God spoke and God speaks. And he speaks to us even now. Pastor West, I just need God to speak. He won't speak to me. Yes, he will. He's speaking every day through 66 books. And any day you pick it up on any page, read it, God will speak to you. No, we're looking for something to come out of the sky. No, he's already come down from eternity to the cross and resurrected from the grave. He's speaking now. And then Jesus on that boat with his disciples and Jesus speaks before the storm in the storm, after the storm. Before the storm, he said, let's go, let's cross to the other side. In the storm, he says, be quiet, hush your mouth. Why are you so fearful? And then after the storm, he want to know one thing, why y'all ain't got no faith? I wake you up every morning. You come to church every week. You sing along at the hymns and the choir. You read along with the scriptures. You hear the sermon. You lift up your hands. When are you going to believe in me that I'm not just a God to put your hands together and clap about? I'm a God that you put your heart in. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. When are you going to believe me? Why do you have no faith? Why are you so afraid? I'm done. John, John, John was uh, on the ship. He learned how to sail early in life. He had taken four or five voyages on the sea before he was six or seven years old. He grew up in a pious home. His mother taught him how to read the scripture. She died, however, young and when he was young from tuberculosis. And so he spent the remainder of his life with these seafarers with his dad, who was a captain on a ship. He later became a captain of a ship. Wow. He had a plantation in West Africa and, uh, and he was sailed the ship from England and Africa and different ports to be colonized later in slave trade. And one night after he almost caused a mutiny with his team to take these slaves that were handcuffed suddenly, no, 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 no warning big gusts of wind and gale and hurricane wind started pushing the ship in his own diary, said violently, pitching it forward and backwards, violently. If so much water was taken into the ship, he felt that they had already been swallowed by the sea and then the strength of the waves peeled away planks of the ship and there they were trying to hold this thing together. He was afraid, and everybody on board was afraid. Though they had been sea-tested and sea-worthy, they were not ready to die at sea. As the captain, they fastened him to the wheel so that he could just hold that wheel, try to sail that ship through the sea. While he was in a storm and rehearsing in his head scriptures that he had been meditating on, his life started changing right there. Not making God no promises. It just started changing right there. The next thing you know, when he got to a desk after that storm had subsided, he did two things. He unfastened the chains of the slaves. He started preaching and became an abolitionist. And then he wrote these words. You may have heard them before. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but 
now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see through many dangers, toils and snares. You know, you will say through many dangers when your life has been tossed from one side to the other, through many dangers, toils and snares. I have already come. It was grace that brought me thus far and grace will lead me home. Have a good day. May God bless you. But I got one more story. Because somebody said, I, I thought you would have told this story earlier. I couldn't because there's too much in the story. That was another sailor and another ship going in another direction. Paul was on a ship on his way to Rome, but he didn't get there on the boat ride because God sunk the ship and then tore the ship apart and then Paul had to be saved on the wreckage of the ship and if that wasn't bad enough when he got to the shore he got bit by a snake but out of the wreckage he was saved he wrote first and second Timothy and probably Philemon but after the storm he had his own story too I fought a good fight I've finished my course and I've kept the faith. There is now laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Somebody right here, you're in a storm, but let me tell you, it's joy on the other side of the storm. The storms can be rough. They can make you sick. They can mess you up. But once you come on the other side of the storm, you're stronger. You are better. You got a different prayer, a different praise. You're not just thanking God for survival. You're thanking him for being good. He's good and his mercy is everlasting. Yeah. Yeah. He's not only the God of the storm, but he's the God on the other side of the storm. Thank you, Lord, for giving us a purpose and keeping that purpose. Thank you, Lord, for the people on the other side. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to us after the storm. Yeah, he's speaking. Right now, when I was a boy growing up, they used to have a song in church that said, the Lord is speaking to you, ooh, ooh, ooh. to you. You know, that's how they were saying it out. The Lord is speaking. Can't you hear what he's saying? The Lord is speaking to you. He speaks through the earthquake. He speaks through the storm tossing. He speaks, the Lord speaks to you. Lord, thank you for speaking to us. Help us to know that your purposes will never be overpowered. That you put a purpose in every person in this room. And you're revealing that purpose. Help us to know that we can either go like Jonah, we can go Jonah chapter 3 obediently, or chapter 1 disobediently. Storms are real though. Then Lord, for the people that's on the other side of the storm, help us to be a witness to them that God can keep them even when it don't look like it. And then, Lord, thank you for keep on speaking. Now we pray for those that are here today that need a relationship with Jesus Christ. Not as a safety net, not as a lifesaver just for hard times in life. But as a living, loving Savior that we surrender you because it's right to do that. And because your grace has led us to do that. As our leaders take their places, Lord, and choir sings without debate or negotiation or discussion, move upon the hearts of people to come forward today. In Jesus' name, for your sake we pray. Amen. Despite what the paintings look like, 
Jesus isn't some sort of stoic holy man unmoved by our pain and sin. Throughout scripture, Christ got sad, glad, and even mad. His emotions reflect the heart of God and connect him with the world he came to save. We want to help you relate to Christ in all of his emotional depth by sending you Pastor Wes's four message CD series, The Emotions of Jesus. This powerful CD series is our way to say thank you for your gift to help transform more lives through the teaching of God's Word. So call now or go online to get your copy of The Emotions of Jesus. And thank you for helping encourage others with God's life-changing Word. Be encouraged. Hi, I'm Pastor Ralph Douglas West from The Church Without Walls. If you are new to the community or been out of church for a while and never visited us, you'll be amazed at how inviting, how relevant, how engaging our church can be. We have something for everyone, regardless of your age, your family dynamic, or your background. Come discover God's love and purpose for you at The Church Without Walls. We're here for you.